right on time. Resuming debate. The uh, Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member from Sackville, Preston Chesakook, for sharing his time with me today. It's an honour to rise today on behalf of the Green Party to speak to this Canada-UK Trade Continuity Agreement, or TCA. I want to recognize that I'm speaking today from the traditional unceded territory of the Sinanimo First Nation. I have many points I want to make about the TCA, but I want to begin by saying that it's time to demand fairness for the 150,000 UK pensioners living in Canada. During these trade negotiations, we must not forget about them. UK pensioners in other countries, including the US, receive annual rate increases tied to the rate of inflation. UK pensioners in Canada do not. This is unacceptable. We end up providing financial support for UK pensioners because of this discriminatory policy. Meanwhile, Canadian pensioners living in the UK receive annual rate increases. We need to demand the same for UK pensioners, and now is the time to do it. The Green Party supports fair and equitable international trade. We want to ensure that trade agreements have enforcement provisions to protect Indigenous rights, workers' rights, consumer, health and environmental standards. We are opposed to any agreement that, does, that contains Investor State Dispute Settlement or ISDS provisions. Trade agreements should not be corporate rights agreements in disguise. We oppose a regulatory race to the bottom. We want to ensure that people in the planet are put before corporate profits. That is the kind of fair trade we support. In February 2020, during the debate on Kuzma, the government made a commitment to be transparent and provide adequate support and notice for all new trade agreements. The government did not fulfill that commitment with this agreement. For decades, there has been demands for increased transparency on how trade agreements are negotiated. I have followed trade agreement debates for many years. It doesn't matter which party is in power, the opposition always complains that there is not enough transparency in the negotiations. That's why I tabled a private member's bill, the Trade and Foreign Investment Agreements Transparency Act, which is modelled on the European Union's process of transparent trade negotiations. The purpose of the Act is to create a transparent consultation and assessment process to ensure that Canada's trade and foreign investment agreements reflect the values and interests of Canada as a whole, take into account the perspectives of various groups, including local communities, civil society organizations, and Indigenous peoples, promote sustainable development and respect for the environment, and adhere to the principles of economic fairness, social justice, and internationally recognized human rights. We need this kind of legislation in Canada to ensure a transparent process. The TC is a transitional trade agreement that replicates the Canada-EU Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, or CETA. <clears throat> the TCA has no end date or sunset clause. If negotiations for this new agreement fail, the TCA could become permanent and bring the worst parts of CETA into our new trade relationship with the e UK. This is not something that we can allow to happen. The stakeholder consultations that occurred for the TCA are completely inadequate for a permanent agreement. The international trade and investment agreements that Canada has signed affect all Canadians, all Canadian businesses and all levels of government. They affect how we govern ourselves all the way down to the local level. This is especially true of the CETA and now the Canada UK TCA. The rules in CETA have, a, have the potential to affect public procurement at all levels of government. For projects above a certain budget level, CETA prohibits the favouring of local bids, applying local content or hiring quotas, or setting aside contracts for small and medium-sized enterprises or minority-owned businesses. CETA could affect Indigenous rights and Indigenous control over traditional lands when those lands are targeted by foreign resource extraction companies. Public services supplied on a commercial basis are automatically included under CETA, unless they have been expressly excluded. This limits the government's ability to regulate foreign service providers. If government wants to provide public services or return a previously privatized service to the public sector, they will be open to challenges from foreign investors. Canada's free trade agreements have hollowed out our manufacturing base, 
We focus on ripping and shipping raw resources, raw bitumen, raw logs, and raw minerals instead of prioritizing value-added domestic manufacturing and using our resources to maximize employment and diversify our economy. We're vulnerable to fluctuations in commodity prices for raw resources. The downturn in oil prices and the cancellation of the Keystone XL pipeline are both perfect examples of this vulnerability. Canada's trade deficit with the EU has increased under CETA. EU companies have an easier time exporting to Canada than Canadian companies have exporting to the EU. A 2019 study shows that the only exports to the EU that have increased are fossil fuels and raw minerals. So CETA hurts value-added industries and benefits rip and ship resource extraction. Canada made major concessions on intellectual property that hurt our pharmaceutical industry. Under CETA, Canada was forced to give drug companies patent extensions for innovative drugs. The EU was not bound by the same rules. How has the CETA agreement helped us procure vaccines for COVID-19? The EU is threatening to block exports of vaccines to Canada until they have enough supply for their own citizens. If we still had a robust pharmaceutical industry in Canada, we wouldn't be in this position. Canada is one of the most open countries for trade and foreign direct investment. There have been more investor state challenges against Canada than against any other country in the OECD. This is not a record to brag about. We give far too much power to foreign investors. Foreign investment is destroying home affordability. Foreign investment in long-term care homes has resulted in seniors living in horrendous conditions. Foreign investors have ripped and shipped resources from this country and left an environmental mess for taxpayers to clean up. The ISDS provisions in the CETA agreement have been suspended for three years with the TCA. Why weren't these provisions completely removed? Do we not trust our justice system to make fair rulings when corporations feel that they're being treated unfairly? There is no justification for a private tribunal system to deal with trade disputes between our two countries. The TC actually states that if we haven't agreed to a new investor state provision in the three years, then the CETA ISDS rules apply. We need to remove ISDS permanently from this agreement and from all our trade agreements. The pandemic has made it clear that we need to support our local supply chains. We've seen how the hollowing out of our manufacturing base and the offshoring of jobs has left us short on personal protective equipment. Greens are particularly concerned about protecting our food supply chain. This makes sense for food security and it also makes sense for lowering the carbon footprint of the food we consume. Canada has vast areas of farmland and is a net exporter of food, but we have become too specialized and too dependent on imports of food that can be produced right here. Since the CETA provisional agreement came into force, the agricultural sector has lost 10% of its exports to Europe, while imports from the EU have increased by 10%. The CETA, along with other trade agreements, has undermined our supply management system, which provides stability for farmers. We need enforceable labor and environmental standards in trade agreements. The labor provisions in CETA are not enforceable and the compliance mechanism is non-binding. The, environment, the environmental provisions are weak with no concrete obligations. The CETA does not protect regulations to address climate change and leaves climate action on the part of the government subject to investor challenges through the ISDS provisions. This is unacceptable to the Green Party. We would hate to see the UK's climate account accountability laws attacked by Canadian corporations using ISDS provisions. Since 2008, the UK, UK has had a real climate accountability law with five-year increments set to carbon budgets. The UK is current, has currently reduced greenhouse gas emissions 40% below 1990 levels, with a target to be 69% below 1990 levels by 2030. Pathetically, Canada has increased its greenhouse gas emissions by 21% above 1990 levels. This is one area where I would love to see Canada adopt UK standards. In closing, the CETA was disappointing, and so is the Canada-UK TCA. Canadian governments need to do a better job of putting the interests of Canadians ahead of large corporations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
Questions and comments? Que commentaire, the Honorable Member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague uh, for his intervention. He made uh, a lot of great uh, uh, claims and, and issues that I think are very important and we should be listening to. One of the things, Mr. Speaker, I want to ask my colleague is, um, and, and highlight it, about the pensions that the people from the UK that came to Canada uh, collecting UK pensions will not get any kind of increases that the UK gets, and yet Canadians living in the UK get that. So this could be very, very costly in, to Canada by uh, we're actually subsidizing the people from UK on some of our programs because of their low rates. Uh, and they're not keeping up with the cost of inflation. So does he agree that this should be looked into and, and uh, the government should be taking a serious approach on this because this is not free, uh, a free trade at all. This, this is something that has to be looked into. Thank member you. for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Well, I'd like to agree with the member from uh, Hamilton Mountain. This is an egregious situation for pensioners here in Canada who are not getting indexed increases to their pension. And this has to stop, and the government needs to take this opportunity when they're negotiating with the UK for a trade agreement that this ends. You know, the US uh, allows indexing. They have an agreement with the UK for in in index increases, a whole bunch of other countries. But here we are, a Commonwealth country, and we are being abused by the UK. Where is the allyship in that? It needs to end. Questions and comments? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. You know, the, the Green Party uh, needs, needs to acknowledge that Canada is, in fact, a trading nation. We need trade. It's critical to our economy and supporting our middle class and so forth. If we take a look at the trade agreements that we've achieved in the last number of, uh, in the last five years, it has been significant. At the same time, our employment prior to the pandemic grew to just over one million uh, people, well over, I should say, one million people, most of which are full time. The Green Party always votes as an opposition of all trade agreements. Can the member indicate any trade agreement that the Green Party has ever supported? Why doesn't the Green Party recognize the true value of trade and how Canada has benefited by it over the years? That's a reality. Member for Nanaimo, Ladysmith. I'd like to thank the honorable member for his question, and he's got a very short memory because the Green Party caucus voted for the Kuzma agreement. We voted for it because the ISDS provisions were removed. It took away the corporate rights agreement, part of that, that uh, agreement. Uh, the um, uh, proportionality clause about exporting oil was taken out of that agreement. So, you know, we're looking for fair trade. We're looking for trade that protects the rights of workers, protects the environment, protects the health and safety standards and consumer standards that we hold dear. We want to see regulatory levels go up, not down, not a race to the bottom. And we want to see, you know, measurements like the, the, uh, the uh, gen genuine progress indicator when we measure how well we're doing with trade. So we consider things like health and the economy and social good and the environment, rather than just how much we rip and ship raw resources for export from this country. Uh, we have time for one more uh, question and response. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his comments. Actually, I agree with quite a number of them. Uh, in fact, uh, with the CETA, uh, agreement. Uh, there were many components to which the NDP were concerned about. The investor state dispute uh, settlement provisions were certainly one of them. The issue around the increased cost in drugs uh, related to the additional patent protection for pharmaceuticals uh, was another. Restrictions on local content provisions for subnational uh, procurement initiatives uh, was uh, a third element. And then, of course, the concessions resulting in the lost market share for Canadian dairy products were also a component to which we were very concerned about. These are just some highlights. So so the real question is, why would the government proceed with this transitional uh, agreement without a sunset clause? The Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. That's a really good question, and it's something that we're concerned about as well, because 
you know, this should have a termination on it. We should be negotiating a, a fair and equitable trade agreement, and we should be dealing with all of those issues that I outlined in my speech and you outlined in, in your question. We need to ensure that we protect our manufacturing base, that we stop hollowing out our manufacturing base. We've seen what this has done with our pharmaceutical industry. We've seen that we've become too dependent on the export of raw resources like raw bitumen through pipelines. And when you know the price of oil changes, when a pipeline uh, project is canceled, that it affects our economy in a, in a detrimental way. So we need to really examine how we do trade properly and and take into the into consideration a, a long list of other things aside from corporate